Yeah, to start off my talk, I'd first like to uh, acknowledge and thank the organizers for inviting me here, uh, especially John Sawson, Mike Neerman, who's in the audience, as well as uh, Chris Klein, who have been working with me quite diligently on some of the projects that I'm going to share with you today. So uh, to give a brief outline to my talk, first I will spend some time to show you the need for speed and for comprehensive characterization of biopharmaceuticals in R&D setting. My talk will be two parts. In the first part, I will describe microdroplet reactions for antibody characterization. Here, first, I will describe techniques that we borrowed or actually collaborated with academic groups to generate antibodies using microdroplets, and they were primarily done in an academic setting with no automation. In the second part of this talk, I will talk about how we moved away from using manual ways of introducing samples to a more automated sample introduction method, such as flow injection analysis with auto samplers introducing the, sample, uh, introducing the uh, reagents for these reactions. Finally, I will uh, conclude this section by looking at how we can couple micro actions with uh, dissociation methods such as electron capture dissociation as well as other type of tandem ion mobility MS experiments uh, that can benefit from uh, real-time digestions and uh, further analysis. In the second part of my talk, I will shift focus from uh, antibodies to actually what's out with, along with the antibodies, such as the impurities. And we've described a method here, and this is rather unique and new, is to find identifications on sizing methods, like size-based uh, size based electrophoretic methods, by making use of MS identifications from capillary zone electrophoresis. I will describe uh, some of the current assays for impurity assessment uh, and the peak identification problem and how we've been able to resolve and propose method methodologies to actually look at uh, these peaks in a more comprehensive manner, but also to place an identification on the unidentified peaks that we normally see in these electrophoretic methods, which are primarily uh, based on UV or fluorescence, not mass spectrometry. Finally, I will conclude my talk and give you some of my uh, perspectives on how these two methods might be very useful for pharma R&D. So I'm in the business of antibody. As you can see, uh, monoclonal antibodies have been like uh, a very popular biotherapeutic uh, for the past, I would say, 20, 25 years. And there are about 100 such molecules out in the market. And there are maybe possibly over 1,000 molecules that are in development. But this is not the, the ones that uh, are, uh, so, so we're kind of moving away from monoclonal antibodies, and we're moving away to uh, these new modalities which are multi-specific. And this is uh, an antibody that harnesses the immune system to target cancer. So there are not just a light and heavy chain that you typically see on a monoclonal antibody. These antibodies are composed of multiple chains. And that introduces a lot of problems because they're uh, transfected using single cell cloning. And once we transfect them, they can form uh, undesired products. And one such undesired product is these chains coming together uh, in the incorrect format, not the multi-specific that we so desire. That leads to chain misfiring. And that's a product quality attribute that we're interested in monitoring to minimize chain misfiring. Another issue is aggregation. So these antibodies uh, consist of single chain FV domains. That's pretty much the variable region of the light chain and heavy chain infused, uh, connected using a linker sequence. So these linkers uh, tend to create uh, domain swapping of these uh, variable regions causing aggregation. And the third uh, point that I want to make here is that these novel sequences can uh, introduce novel substrates for enzymes that are in the cells to create uh, undesired degradation products due to clipping. So to briefly introduce what uh, R&D pipeline looks like, there are different discovery and development phases uh, that's shown here. Uh, targets are declared, and then um, molecules enter the portfolio. And you can see the number of candidates in lead generation can range from 100 to about 1,000 molecules. 
and then it goes through lead selection to cell line development, where it kind of reduces in numbers for to about less than a dozen molecules. In our uh, pipelines, usually we have about one to four molecules left coming to cell line development. So during cell line development, we have this triaging process again, where we are looking at thousands of colonies, and then when we go through the best and most optimum cell line, which has the highest titer with the most desired um, product quality attributes, it ends up to being a single colony with perhaps a backup colony that really goes into late phase development. So as you can see that any one of these stages, discovery or development, uh, requires triaging the number of molecules are close to single digits to uh, further develop in late phase development. So if you want to do this comprehensively and uh, in, in, a, in a high throughput fashion so that our programs enter uh, into late phase development, Analytica cannot be the bottleneck. So to mitigate, invested a lot in trying to fully automate all our processes. This include both sample preparation as well as the bioinformatics. So it's truly an end-to-end -end pipeline that we've developed. And I won't go into a lot of the details, but the bioinformatics is pretty much looking at all the data files that are collected in an autonomous fashion, uh, doing all the searches for peptide maps as intact mass data that are deconvoluted on the cloud and then aggregated in gene data biologics. So that was completely automated a few years ago, but more recently we've added on the missing link, which was sample preparation. And here what we're doing is having liquid handling systems automatically deliver samples to the mass spec. So it's completely robotically controlled. And we are filling in the gap by having gene data that completed the analysis, providing the data or information that's needed to do this automation upfront for sample preparation. So it's a complete end-to-end -end automation process. So we are definitely interested in, uh, in looking at sample prep and looking at methods that can speed up sample prep. So this work was uh, using microplot reactions. That was an academic group that pioneered this. Uh, Graham Cooks has done this, uh, in, uh, uh, pioneered this, this work. And we've collaborated with Dick Zayer's group at Stanford, as well as Hao Chen's group at NGIT to look at how microdroplets can be used to characterize biotherapeutics. So microdroplet generation can be twofold. One is we can introduce these reagents in a mixing tea and introduce it into a, into a mass spectrometer. And the time it takes to mix and introduce is about four seconds. Uh, and the second method that's shown in the bottom is that you can have two emitters flow the two different reagents so that they can have a fusion zone. And if you have the proper distance, you facilitate these reactions, and that's much faster. It takes place by about 250 microseconds. So we've used these technologies and adopted them to digest antibodies. And antibody characterization, uh, which is known as subunit analysis, one form of characterizing them is to use an enzyme to cut at a very specific place on the antibody to generate these small pieces that are very useful uh, to look at modifications that are occurring in certain parts of the antibody and to do it comprehensively and in a high throughput fashion, uh, we can use these micro droplets. So this was the first publication on uh, how we use micro droplet chemistries to characterize antibodies. This was published a year, year and a half ago. And what's shown on the right hand side is two approaches where we compared micro droplet reactions with the standard bulk reaction. So typically for the reaction that is called ITES, that cleaves the antibody below the disulfide bonds produces, and in a microdroplets uh, uh, reaction where they are infused using different syringes, it takes about four seconds. And what we are doing is collecting the spray, reconstituting, and then introducing into the mass spectrometer. What's important to note here is that the setup itself takes a lot of time, about 15 minutes, to set these syringes. And this is not really amenable to a high throughput uh, situation in a pharmaceutical setting. In the second case where we do the bark reaction, we do the digestion in five minutes. Typically, the ice reaction takes about an hour to perform. And what you can see are the spectra that's in the bottom. Where you can see complete digestion of the antibody into its subunits, the FC subunit and the FAT prime 2. And the FC has its, all its glycoforms, and the FAT prime 2, you can see, is the most dominant uh, peaks in the spectra. 
bottom is the same reaction done in bulk for five minutes, and you can see that the antibody is completely undigested. It remains um, as, as an intact antibody. So given that uh, antibody takes about 60 minutes to digest by ice, uh, and micro droplets in 250 microseconds. It's about a 7.5 million fold increase in speed that you get from micro droplets. So it's very attractive to do this uh, in an in a aut automated setting. But for this uh, study, we completely relied on syringe pumps, and we can now do these reactions in tandem where we can do two steps. First step is to remove the glycans, strip the glycans from the antibody and then reconstitute, load it again to a syringe, and perform ice digestion with a T-step reduction step. When you do that, the deconvoluted spectrum that you got on the right-hand side is three chains with no glycans on the FC. So you can combine microdroplet reactions where you don't do uh, T-step reduction, but you introduce ice in a separate syringe and collect the, uh, the, the, the flow of the droplets, and then what you see at the bottom are just subunits. And this is a typical workflow that we normally do in industry to look at post-translation and modifications that are present in the three chains. You can also introduce them in separate sprayers. In this case, the first sprayer does the one-pot reaction. So you have IDES, the intact antibody, as well as the t cell producing agent. And the second sprayer is used to introduce charged, uh, it's, it's acidic solution. It introduces the charged droplets so that you can actually maintain uh, good ionization of the reaction products. So what we do from here is uh, see if we can use a commercial source to do these types of microdroplet reactions. And we are using or uh, leveraging the Agilent's jet stream technology where uh, you know, the sheet gas that you can see produces a jet stream with finer droplets. And we've done simulations prior to this where we can see that you need sub-10 micron diameter droplets to perform these micro droplet reactions. Uh, the jet stream also offers another advantage is that it can produce smaller size droplets that can increase the signal to noise. So this is a uh, dynamic simulation that uh, is useful in calculating the time it takes for these droplets to be generated. So at the best case, we can perform these at these velocities at the initiation of the spray at about 20 microseconds. And we believe that most of the micro droplet chemistry happens within the three millimeters, three to six millimeters of this plume. But if we take a more conservative approach because these ion trajectories are more complicated, it can take up to about a element it pumps into the mass spectrometer and we do that every two minutes using flow injection analysis so what is shown here is the injection valve switching back and forth to uh, uh, to draw the samples mix them and then eject them in or inject them into a uh, empty well where they can be mixed further with the uh, enzymes and then you can actually uh, switch the valve from main pass to bypass and introduce the samples directly into the mass spectrometer. This is flow injection analysis. There is no columns or column-based separations. It directly goes in, uh, and we are doing these under native conditions so that we can facilitate these microdroplet reactions in real time. So what you're seeing is five, six different injections, and the first five are uh, reactions that were performed, and each one takes about two minutes, and the data is shown at the bottom for the first five runs. And the last run is the intact antibody without any reaction. That was kind of a control. So here are some examples I want to show with this approach is the ice reaction, where you produce a Fab Prime 2 and the FC. So ice cleaves right at the bottom of the hinged disulfides to produce these major fragments. What's interesting here is under native conditions, the FC doesn't remain uh, as a monomer. It dimerizes through non-covalent interactions. And what you see here is a dominant Fab prime two uh, fragment, which is kind of the business end of the molecule that we are interested in. So we can also throw in the second uh, reagent, which is a T cell reduction step, and we are still doing it in the auto sampler. And what we are getting here is the light chain, the FP prime, uh, getting uh, digested and reduced. And then we also observe, interestingly, this Fab prime two uh, 
Fab prime, which is a combination or non-covalent interaction of the FP and the light chain. And then, of course, the FC still remains as a dimer due to non-covalent interactions. Now, in order to prove that these are non-covalent interactions, we've gone and fragmented them uh, in the Agenda 6545 so that we can see these chains falling apart. And if you increase the voltage or the collision energy uh, settings a little bit higher, you get further evidence that there is charge asymmetric or charge symmetry in this case of this dissociation. So charge is conserved, the mass is conserved here. You can see the 15 plus charge falling apart to the two different FD and LC with the appropriate charges being conserved. So the next experiment we did was use a different enzyme. And this enzyme is uh, called Fabalactica, it's the commercial name, it's IDGE. And what it does is it cleaves above the hinge disulfides again two pieces but now when we do this you can see the hinge disulfides are preserved so you maintain this disulfide bonding between the FC chains and you also maintain the disulfide bridge that holds the light chain and the heavy chain so it's a truly a fab domain so when we subject the fab uh, arm which is kind of the binding arm to MSMS we can do this real-time microdroplet digestion and combine it with the characterizations that we do MSMS to sequence the, uh, the FAB domain. So what is the use of this is that we can monitor any type of post-translation modification on the FAB real time. So this, the experiment in the bottom is a spectra where we force stress the antibody, the same antibody with glucose and we try to prove that we can actually mass select a modified species and then localize where this modification is occurring on the fab. Then we use a second, en uh, the third enzyme, which is a PNGSF. PNGSF uh, does deglycosylation of the glycans. And what you see here are spectra that uh, completely deglycosylates the map and reduce the, reduces the heterogeneity. So there is advantage of doing that real time because we can also make use of this improved signal to do further fragmentation. What we've done next is to couple this with the IDES reaction that we've introduced earlier with PNGSF. And if you see the first step is just generating the two major fragments and the second step is to strip all the glycans from the FC uh, dimer in this case. And if you zoom in on this region, you can see that you get the completely glycosylated FC dimer along with the signals from the enzyme, both IDES as well as PNGSF. But there is enough uh, selectivity here. If you need to, you can go and further interrogate that uh, fragment with MSMS. So I would like to uh, uh, show that we've next gone on to uh, look at different types of antibodies that have more complex glycosylation. And I'm not going to be talking about this in detail because there's a talk given by uh, Chris Klein from Agilent on this, where we've examined microdroplet chemistry in conjunction with ion mobility mass spectrometry to look at and resolve glycosylations and even enhance the signal to noise of low abundance glycoforms. And we can actually see additional glycoforms that you really don't see when you do a first pass microdroplet digestion because of the ion suppression effects. We've also performed electron capture dissociation. Uh, in conjunction with microdroplet reactions, and this is complementary to the collision induced dissociation data that we get, and uh, this is going to be extremely useful for looking at post translation modifications that we typically ascertain by peptide mapping. More recently, through academic collaborations, again with Dick Sales Group at Sanford and Howell's group, uh, we were able to uh, perform this microdroplet chemistry with trypsin digestion. And this can be extremely useful for peptide mapping. And interestingly, we found out that trypsinization produces low deamidation under microdroplet conditions compared to its bulk digestion. So in summary, we demonstrate successful microdroplet digestions uh, of antibodies using multiple different enzymes. And we've also demonstrated how this can be automated using flow injection analysis under native mass spec conditions. And further, we've extended these uh, methodologies to other types of tandem MS experiments, such as ion mobility, tandem with mass analysis, as well as electron capture dissociation 
uh, as a complementary fragmentation to electron uh, collision induced dissociation methods. So switching gears, I would like to go over the second part of my talk, which is how we can map, map impurities using size-based electrophoresis method combining capillary zone electrophoresis, MS, as a way to identify and then uh, map unknowns in UV and fluorescence-based uh, sizing methods. So in, in this talk, uh, in this part, I will actually show you potential sources of impurities and how we assess these impurities and the peak identification problem in these methods and propose a new strategy to identify uh, peaks that are uh, un uh, ambiguous uh, using CZEMS data as well as uh, a new way of mapping migration times accurately, which I will go into more details. So if you uh, look at these three examples that are listed here. They emulate bioprocessing systems uh, for various types of impurities. The first is uh, actually a, a degradation of products that can lead to uh, the dissociation of the chains, and this happens in bioreactors under uh, certain conditions where the feeds on the media influence uh, the generation of hydrogen sulfides. And the hydrogen sulfides actually reduce uh, the disulfide bonds and we monitor them by actually a sizing method called GX2, which, uh, which is a chip-based uh, size, uh, uh, chip-based electrophoretic method uh, to separate uh, uh, these fragments. In the second example, we are using, uh, we are examining catepsin degradation, and catepsin is known to be a host cell protein in a cell culture harvest that can um, result in the clipping of the biotherapeutic. And we use that, uh, uh, those, those catepsin enzymes to look at uh, digestion products. And the last one I won't be going through is uh, today is uh, a high pH stress condition that we encounter in uh, bioprocessing. And we can also look at degradation products of uh, antibodies that are susceptible to high pH degradation. So to introduce what is the problem of peak detection is any one of these techniques detects peaks, UV or fluorescence, but they don't really tell what they are. The identification is not really known for most of the peaks that we observe uh, in biophysical characterization of biotherapeutics. Uh, so the ID piece is still missing. So to uh, show what we've done with this type of data, which is a lab chip, uh, GX2, uh, which I'll be showing, is to use this method for high throughput analysis of major impurities. This is really rapid. It can be performed in less than a minute. So in 30 seconds, you can get an impurity profile, and it's very uh, popular in industry to do this in discovery. So what you're seeing here is the antibody, uh, unstressed, you can see there are some peaks, but they can be uh, uh, they can be enhanced by stressing them further with hydrogen sulfide. So the same peaks they increase upon hydrogen sulfide stress. So these are unknowns at this point, and these uh, uh, these time points can be calibrated based on uh, a calibration ladder that we deploy in this analysis. And they are pretty much low molecular weight standards. And these low molecular weight standards are used and extrapolated to obtain the high mass fragments that we see in these antibodies. So that's problem number one. So in order to mitigate these problems, we can use CZEMS. Uh, and we can get MS identifications of the same samples. Uh, and what you're seeing here is, is hydrogen sulfide induced degradation products. And upon forming these uh, trisulfides that you are seeing, uh, the bonds become weaker, and that leads to the degradation uh, to these different chains. So with this information, if you go and try to calibrate or recalibrate the size axis, you can actually make assignments clearly to some of the ones that we identified. So as you can see, there is a peak that is still missing. Not everything is identifiable by uh, a mass spectrometry. And we were able to use what was identified through this linear regression to obtain 
what could be the peak that was missing even in its CZEMS. So the identification strategy is as follows. So we have uh, time information that we get from these electrophoretic methods. What we do is we get the inverse of the time, which is the mobility, and we plot uh, mobility, uh, the, the log molecular weight versus mobility, and calculate approximate masses of impurities using a regression analysis. Then we do the CZEMS identification of these impurities, and then combining both these, we can refine the unknown peaks that we observe in these electrophoretic methods and report correctly identified peaks. I'll walk you through some of the ways in which we do this. So this is what the um, linear regression looks like for these antibody fragments that we know. And then we can approximate the molecular weight of the species through this linear regression. But we've also made use of two things. One is to use CZEMS masses to get theoretical masses. But we also use a process which we developed called minimization of time errors in the regression analysis, which I will go through. So to give you an example, this is uh, a trace, what a trace looks like for a GX2 experiment, uh, a, a bunch of peaks. Uh, and what we're showing here in color coded is catepsin digestion under different pH conditions. In red, you will see peaks for catepsin D at pH 5. In blue, you will see catepsin L at pH 3. And in green, you will see catepsin L at pH 7. So under different catepsins, as well as different pH conditions, they lead to different fragments. And you can clearly see there is a time-dependent increase in the fragmentation for some of the catepsins and under some pH conditions. So now these are all unknowns because we don't have any mass information. And at, at best, we can just guess what they are. And that's what pharma is currently uh, using uh, or using some uh, limited mass spec information to annotate these peaks. So what we've done here is we've looked at the CZEMS profiles and obtained clips. So we know what the clips are based on their theoretical masses. And catepsin L produces an AA clip, which is uh, a clip that happens on the light chain. And adjacent to that, there is a FI clip, and that can also lead to uh, this small piece. So using uh, uh, mass alone is not enough to confirm these, these peaks. So we've done also MSMS using CZ, uh, EMS, MS to confirm these peaks. And what you're seeing is uh, sequence confirmation using this data. So once we do this, we can go back and look at how we can assign. So uh, we were still not able to identify uh, catepsin D at pH 5. At uh, catepsin LPH 3, we were able to now identify uh, the AA clips based on the regression analysis. Uh, and then on catepsin LPH 7, we got unique fragments that we don't get uh, for catepsin L at pH 3, which is a FI clip, which we were able to assign. So this is from based on the, the calibration that I just showed you earlier. And <coughs> now, we still have uh, additional information that we can obtain by CZMS. And here, what we've done here is uh, use this fragment. And we are able to even annotate peaks that we didn't initially even assign, 1 through 10. So we were able to assign this peak uh, at pH 3 catepsin L exclusively found in pH 3 catepsin L to this species. And we can assign that quite accurately. Now, we still have certain peaks that we didn't identify. There's still 1, 2, 5, and 8 that are question marks here. Uh, and using uh, what's known as minimization of time errors is what we do here is we minimize the error that we get based on a calibration uh, on our regression analysis. But we also have theoretical masses for each of the known fragments. And what we are trying to do for each of the peaks is to minimize the time errors that we see for each of the fragments, theoretical fragments that we get from the analysis. So in principle, you can throw in any type of fragment in and see uh, what the migration time errors should be for that particular fragment. So in this case, peaks 1 through 8, 1, 2, 5, and 8, we were able to assign quite accurately to new types of clips 
that we didn't do uh, well in the first pass. So now we have uh, new assignments to 1, 2, 5, and 8. The peaks are now assigned. So this is the picture now that we get when we combine what was not identified with the ones that were identified. Now, is it still correct? The answer is no, because what we did was we found more peaks that uh, were closer in retention, uh, uh, migration time errors than what we had initially thought from the regression analysis. So in this case, what we are seeing is two different unique clips uh, for catepsin L, which is a HT cleavage of the uh, light uh, right below the hinge of the heavy chain that will re result in this fab prime. It's called a light chain heavy, uh, heavy chain uh, HT clip. And then the second one uh, uh, is this SS clip, uh, which happens on the light chain again, which will lead to this uh, uh, species, which is the intact antibody mass minus the clip species. So that's a bigger mass. So with this information, if you go and do this uh, migration time minimization, we can see that these assignments are now uh, for peak four and five uh, have to be reassigned to these precise masses that we obtained by CZEMS. So with this information, if you go, you can see that peak four is no longer the heavy chain that we initially proposed. It's this uh, uh, intact antibody with, uh, it has a HT clip, and then the heavy heavy is no longer heavy heavy, it's the intact antibody minus the SS clip. So with all this information, now we are able to uh, annotate all the peaks quite accurately. And uh, we can label all the peaks uh, with these type of, types of uh, analysis. So in summary, we were successfully able to demonstrate this approach of accurate peak identifications of size-based electrophoretic methods by uh, two methods. One is to use CZEMS identifications as well as to uh, use this uh, migration time error minimization method. Uh, we've shown two examples, several examples, to how it can be used in a biopharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical settings to look at impurities and then uh, how CZMS is uh, important in identification of peaks and assigning uh, unknowns in the size-based electrophoretic methods, such as GX2. So in conclusions, I hope I was able to convince that uh, there are two technologies that can uh, be used quite well uh, to improve both the speed as well as the um, comprehensive characterization of antibodies. And the first, we showed the speed advantage that we get from micro droplets. And in the second, we showed an approach where we can identify impurities uh, by using CZEMS identifications. So both these parts are going to be presented at ASMS this year. Uh, the first uh, part will be presented by Chris Klein. And the second uh, half of the talk is going to be presented again as an oral by uh, Jim Lau. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'd like to acknowledge all the, all the uh, colleagues at Janssen, uh, collaborators with, uh, at Agilent, uh, CMP Scientific, as well as Emission, uh, who did most of the electron capture dissociation work, and our academic collaborators and protein metrics uh, for being a wonderful partner in some of the bioinformatics and data analysis. Thank you. Um, in the first part of your talk, you talked about you know, using TSEP to reduce the disulfide bonds. Do you ever find that the um, stability of those bonds is such that the TSEP doesn't work? Uh, in our hands, TSEPs have, uh, so you use DTT or TSEP, right? Those are the most popular ones that we use. Uh, from uh, TSEP has a wide pH range, we find that to be more of a, a strong reducing agent as well. So in our hands, I think we've been very successful in reducing uh, most of the disulfides completely. Uh, there may be intra-chain disulfides that might not be reduced, but uh, through our mass analysis, we find that those to be also completely reduced. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, TSEP does a pretty decent job in reducing most of the disulfides. Any other questions?
partly it's it's essential we move to more of these IDIS type applications because if we're going to try to do these really complex molecules with trips and digests, we're going to be guessing at everything. So you've got to start looking at these larger subunits. And so having automated real-time digestion techniques, but then secondly, the fact that you could use the CEMS is interesting because I don't think we pull those things apart in any form of LC that we have right now. And and, and being able to get all of those impurities identified in poly specifics, maybe just comment on complexity of what we're dealing with when we move to these polyspecifics and, and the challenges in separation, I, I, I think LC starts running out of gas. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic question. I think to ask your first question on multi-specifics, they are very much more complex than standard antibodies and we have uh, many different ways in which you can approach, uh, you know, uh, impurity assessments for uh, multi-specific antibodies. So, Chain mispairing is one such uh, example that I didn't have a chance to go through, but um, but examples that I've shown are for the standard monoclonal antibodies. But you can imagine that chain mispairing uh, benefits to screen large number of engineered molecules very fast using these mitral droplets. Uh, if, if this can be implemented in an autonomous fashion like I've shown. So you can actually do chain mispairing analysis very rapidly. Right? And that's needed currently, and pharma does not do it in this fashion uh, because, um, uh, and, and what that does is it will help to uh, go through many different molecules, large numbers, and the probability of success can be increased by going for large numbers with the throughput that you gain. So that's number one. And the second one, uh, second application I foresee for micro droplet chemistry with multi-specifics is that you can use this also as a binding assay to assess uh, how tight uh, these multi-specifics can bind to multiple targets simultaneously using this micro droplet chemistry. So those are two areas that we're focusing for furthering these experiments as a future research. And then going back to your second idea about how we can use uh, CZMS over LCMS and your uh, you're very accurate by saying that, uh, yes, we did not see most of the chains uh, or impurities by LCMS, but we did see them more, uh, more selectively and more efficiently using CZMS. So I think the peak capacities uh, enable us to detect more things, but there's still some signal suppression issues still with CZMS. So not everything, uh, every peak that we identify by some size-based method can be actually seen by even mass spec detection. It might uh, be elusive, but um, it does seem to be uh, doing a better job than LCMS in our hands, so. That was a long answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much, excellent.